Hello and welcome. Following a piece I did on Telegraph Hill, I promised to talk a bit about Coy Tower, which of course sits at the top of the hill. Truly a most wonderful adornment to the city, adding its exclamation mark to a very special part of town. It came to us in the middle of the Great Depression, having been completed in 1933. It is a most pleasant sight to behold. It is also a most pleasant sight from which to observe everything around it. 210 feet in height, it sits atop the 285-foot elevation of Telegraph Hill. So, the view from the top of the tower is spectacular. When one is talking about having the best seat in the house, Telegraph Hill has always afforded such. Overlooking the city's earliest beginnings, its excellent position was always keenly appreciated, as from its apex, one could see all of the bay and out through the Golden Gate. Very early on, its vantage point would be utilized by a signal station, which would alert the new settlement of shipping that would enter the bay. Over some years, the signal station would be no more, and though the hill would see folks building upon its slopes, it would be done so by a very hardy few who would trade having to hike its steep grades for the lower cost of the real estate that stemmed from that very situation. But nonetheless, it was still the best seat in the house. And a fellow named Frederick Lehman believed it to be also. In the 1880s, Lehman wanted to build a cable car line up Telegraph Hill, hoping that, like Knob Hill, where the rich barons of the Comstock loads and the railroad empires enjoyed its heights, providing a means of ascending Telegraph Hill would encourage similar development, and from that, he could enjoy the profit thereof. But with Telegraph Hill being only sparsely settled at the time, it was clear that there would be little patronage of his cable railway. So, this was Lehman's Dilemma. It was kind of a chicken or the egg, what came first type of a problem. Building the cable car line would not generate much revenue prior to the hill's development. But with the hill's steep grades, development on the hill would not come without the means of reaching its heights. Faced with this dilemma, Lehman came up with a plan to attract folks to the hill. He would build an observatory at the top of the hill complete with a restaurant and bar. This, of course, would attract many a patron. So indeed, Lehman's Castle, as it would be known, was built. It opened on July 4th, 1882. Now, while the observatory did attract some patronage, it would still necessitate quite a hike up to it, as the cable car line to it would not be in operation until June of 1884, two years later. But there was indeed a great celebration upon the line's opening. Large crowds would turn out to enjoy the new funicular railway's operation to the observatory at the top. Unfortunately, the little funicular ascending Greenwich Street would never see the great patronage that Lehman had dreamed of, and it ceased operations in less than two years. And what of the castle? Well, the castle would pass through several hands of management, but patronage would not be meager over its last years. In a rather desperate attempt to attract business, one proprietor staged exhibitions where knights in full armor would on horseback duel each other with broadswords. But quickly the crowds diminished, as did the castle. Deteriorating from the weather and finally catching fire in 1903, though not completely consumed in the fire, the remainder of the wood structure would provide fuel for many a stove on the hill. The top of the hill 
would become a city park in 1876, the site being bought by a group of local businessmen, including George Hurst. They then donated the land to the city for a public park to be named Pioneer Park. And this is where Coit Tower stands today. Now to the story of how Coit Tower came to be built here. The story starts with a lady named Lily Hitchcock Coit. Born at West Point, New York in 1843, she came west with her mother and father, Martha and Charles Hitchcock. Charles was a U.S. Army surgeon. Her father would leave her a large inheritance. Lily would later marry Howard Coit, himself quite successful, as the caller at the San Francisco Stock Exchange. Though quite the social belle, Lily was quite the eccentric. She smoked cigars, was an avid gambler, and wore trousers, dressing as a man, to gain entrance into the male-only gambling establishments of North Beach. As a young woman, she was fascinated with firefighters. When she was 15, she witnessed the volunteer Knickerbocker 5 Engine Company respond to a call on Telegraph Hill. As they were short-handed, they struggled as they pulled their engine up the hill. Lily quickly joined with them in their effort, calling on others to help get the engine up the hill. She would become the company's mascot, and in 1863, the Knickerbocker 5 Engine Company would make her an honorary member. She would ride the engine in parades and celebrations. When firefighters were sick, she would visit them. When they died, she would send flowers and attend their funerals. Firebell Lil would forever wear the number five. When she passed away in 1929, she bequeathed a third of her estate, $118,000, to the city of San Francisco, quote, to be expended in an appropriate manner for the purpose of adding to the beauty of the city, which I have always loved. Part of her bequest would provide for a monument honoring the volunteer firemen of early San Francisco. It sits in Washington Square today. The remainder of her gift would provide for the design and construction of the tower. Proposed by Art Commission President Herbert Fleischacker and designed by Arthur Brown Jr. and Henry Howard, construction of the tower started in 1932. As the tower was being completed in 1933, 26 artists were employed by the Public Works of Art Project, a precursor to the WPA, to paint the fresco murals that grace the interior walls of the tower. During the time of the 1934 Longshoremen strike, much controversy would arise over some of the mural's radical content. Indeed, the tower's windows were painted over for a time, and the doors of the tower would be padlocked as a portion of the murals would be removed and repainted. But the tower was finally opened to the public in October of 1934. The murals wonderfully depict the life and times of California during the tough times of the Depression, Of course, for all of us railroaders, one of my favorite scenes. The 
One very small part of a mural has caught my eye and has indeed perplexed me. A sign for the San Francisco Giants, San Francisco's Major League Ball Club, appears on a building in the scene. But since this would have been painted into the fresco some 24 years prior to the Giants coming into the city from New York in 1958, it really raises a mysterious question. How did the painter foretell this? And so, here it stands. And let us enjoy the beauty of it and the beauty of all the views surrounding it. A wonderful spot to take in. Oh, and by the way, should my wonderful wife be asking what happened to that piece from her vacuum cleaner set, just do what I do. Shrug your shoulders and give her a smile.